First, welcome to the last day and post-lunch session of this PDC. Hope you've enjoyed the conference so far. Uh, just to have a quick show of hands, how many of you here haven't attended, weren't here for Brad Abrams' Building Amazing Application Talk? A handful, a handful of you. Okay. Uh, just to set the expectations right, I'm, this talk is a follow-on of that, but I'll briefly cover the context. I'm not, this is not a, a basic introduction to real services talk. This is mastering real services. So I'm going to sort of build on the base, but even if you haven't attended the talk, don't worry about it. Uh, if you have, then this will be different. If you haven't, then this will be different anyway. And, uh, so you don't have to worry about that. All right. Um, so my name is Dinesh Kulkarni. I'm a program manager in the developer division at Microsoft. And um, ever since completing the shipping V1 of Flink project, I've been working on RIA services. And so this is very near and dear to my heart. And uh, we are getting to a point where we are very uh, close to kind of shipping. We've got a beta out. And this is the time to kind of come back to you. Many of you have given us feedback in the past on forums, uh, in email, and so on. Uh, and to kind of play it back and show you how, what we've done, how it all works out. So overall agenda is basically three parts. I'll briefly cover the context. That's going to be a fairly uh, uh, basic kind of uh, introduction. I'm not going to go into uh, the standard drag and drop and all the fancy tooling. But after that, I'll go into kind of a uh, deep dive and under the hood look, where I'll take the same app that was used in the previous talk, and instead of kind of showcasing how you build it from scratch, I'll actually go and show you how it works. And then finally, uh, I'll touch upon some of the basic points, the key uh, aspects of how to best use real services in your apps and how to best build your rich internet applications. So let's start with the overall context and where it fits. Um, I'm sure most of you have seen this kind of an N-tier slide many times before. There are all these different tiers. There's the uh, data tier, which is often database or some other source of data. You've got mid-tier that has some data access layer, some application logic. You might have a separate services tier or not. And then you've got the presentation tier, where with something like Silverlight or even Ajax, you've got a much better opportunity to write application logic on the client to make a very responsive application. And then you've got your views, whether it's you know, HTML in case of ASP.NET apps, your uh, WinForms or your um, WPF apps, it's going to be your XAML or in Silverlight XAML as well. What WPF real services is concerned with is the box that I've circled there. It's basically the piece between the two tiers, something that bridges the two tiers, it's a place where you write your application logic, and something that connects to the data access layer on the one hand and views on the other. Now, it's not just any entire system, it's also where you've got a very important trust boundary. With Silverlight, you get the advantages of web-based deployment, but you also have to think about what it means to have a trust boundary and how to work across it. If you're building enterprise apps for within intranet usage, you still want to follow the base practices and not expose all the data uh, that's not needed. And at the same time, if you're building, obviously, public-facing internet applications, then you've got to be even more mindful of what you're exposing, what operations are allowed, and so on. So the whole design of WCF Real Services is mindful of the tier split and the trust boundary that exists between the tiers. In short, uh, what Real Services is, is framework. That means a set of DLLs that go with the .NET, that sit on top of .NET framework, and a set of DLLs that sit on top of Silverlight that go into your Zap. It's also a set of tools that integrate with Visual Studio. We've got wizards, we've got a whole project system uh, add-in, and we've got a few other things that are kind of critical to giving you the overall feel of a single app. And then a set of services that actually consume the libraries and the tools and give you basic capabilities like authentication, roles, uh, user profiles, and so on. And all this comes with essentially prescriptive patterns. What it means is that we have a set of guidelines for how to best use the framework. There's plenty of flexibility for you to go down another level and try different things with WCA or something else that's underneath. However, 
Uh, overall, if you want to use the higher levels of abstraction, it's best used with the prescriptive patterns that are supported by the framework. Recently, in fact, yesterday, the announcement was made that our name, uh, the name of this component changed from what was called .NET Real Services to WCF Real Services. The reason for that is we've really done uh, a lot of integration work in the last couple of months with WCF, and we wanted to highlight the fact that this is all part of the WCF family. So it's a set of things that was covered actually in another talk, uh, building REST applications with .NET Framework. So I won't be going into details of all these different blocks, but I'll be focusing on real services here. And within this family, real services works best when you are building a single app. So instead of publishing a service to millions of people or uh, uh, taking your data and exposing it in a restful fashion over the web for multiple clients, if you're building an app, this is fairly optimized for that. This is also based on a set of common design principles. And these design principles are based on some of the best practices we've observed over the years in ASP.NET. The first thing we've done is we've sort of taken a look at what it means to have an application that's split between tiers and what it takes to integrate it end to end. And what it means is that any concern about taking the data out of your data store, uh, exposing it selectively, taking it to the presentation tier, data binding it, uh, change tracking it, bringing it back is all covered under this one. And the same kind of thinking goes into services, whether you're authenticating users or whether you're using roles or profiles. The second kind of key decision that we made very early in the cycle was to be prescriptive. I've talked a little bit about that, uh, but just to kind of uh, emphasize that point, uh, we've added a pattern on top of WCF services. Uh, so with WCF, you can write your operations any which way you want. You still can. And what real services does, or what the domain service part in real services does, is it lets you write it in a certain fashion that makes the rest of the framework just flow with it. We'll spend a lot of time in, um, on this pattern and the kind of prescription that we have. And then finally, the decision we made early on was to not tie it to any specific data access layer. How many of you here use uh, Entity Framework or Link to SQL? That's a substantial number, but still minority. And that's exactly the reason why we started out by saying that even though we'll provide you the best experience with the data access layers available in .NET Framework, this is not going to be tied to it. And in fact, in my demo, I'm going to show it all working against nHibernate, just to kind of drive the point home. Another point related to kind of the uh, data access layer neutrality is we sort of have our vision of making sure that we enable other uh, sources of data and other presentation models as well. Certainly, starting with a database and having Silverlight UI is a great way of using real services, but that's not the only way. You could be using your data coming from a web service. It could be just a set of objects in memory, and we are completely agnostic as to where you get it from. Or it could be coming from cloud. Uh, you could be deploying your app to Azure or getting your data from some other cloud-based storage, and that's perfectly reasonable and perfectly within uh, the scope of what we've targeted. Now for V1, our focus is on Silverlight as the presentation tier. However, we do have in the design uh, the capability to go, for, go forth and use it with Ajax. Um, same way with ASP.NET as well. In fact, right out of the box, you get ASP.NET domain data source control. And that control helps you kind of generate HTML pages and standard web form style UI, if you so wish. Further, you could also use it in order to expose your data in a, uh, as a JSON endpoint, as SOAP, XML, for any interop reasons that you want. So you could have normal services client consume it as well, if that's what you choose. So that kind of brings me to the second part of the talk. This is now the main part of the talk, which is a look under the hood. For this one, I've got a set of different things I want to cover, which is what is the view that is at, the des at design time, what it looks like at runtime, and then what kinds of services we've got around it. But before I go into all that, let me show you the app quickly. For those of you who've seen this app, um, seen the previous talk by Brad Abrams, this is a familiar app. But I'm just going to go ahead and run it. Uh, for those of you who, have, who weren't there in the talk, this is, a, this is an app for the foodies. <laughs> 
it shows a set of restaurants and it shows a set of plates that are or dishes that are available in the restaurants. And what you can do is you can browse that, you can uh, go click on one of the uh, restaurants and say I want to see the details of it, see the plates, navigate around, um, see what else is interesting and so on. So that's basically a simple app. I'm going to use this app and dive into the details of how it actually works. Uh, for those who are interested in how this got built using all the nice tooling, the wizards, the data sources window, uh, I would recommend that you go back and take a look at, uh, well, you could use advanced technology and use the beta of Time Machine. And if you're uh, not quite up to that kind of adventure, you could just go back and watch the video. Um, and that sort of covers the first experience with real services where you can drag and drop and do all the nice things. But for now, let's look at the details. So the first part is, what does the design time look like? The design view that you see is a single solution first. And that single solution has two projects. There's a server project and there's a client project. And that together is stitched in a single solution. Now, that is different from what you would do in a typical uh, normal services project. You would just publish a service. Somebody else could consume it completely separately from the app. And that is not the sweet spot for this. The sweet spot for this is really to be able to build your app and have this mindful notion of multiple tiers in it. So within the server app, you've got data access layer and a set of entities. And I'm using the term entities to mean essentially the general notion of what an entity is. You might have customers. You might have, in this case, restaurant or plate. Those kinds of entities is what you would have. You might use whatever uh, favorite data access layer you have. You might cobble up your entities yourself, just write them as a C-sharp class, howsoever. And then you might have some already developed views in the client project, or you might go ahead and develop them later. But that's sort of your starting point. This is so in data access layer and the views, the real services itself is not involved. But the middle piece is where the real services pieces start to help you. So the first thing you would do is you would write a domain service class and a set of methods within that. And I'm deliberately going through this in a pictorial form before going into the code uh, so that you can get a general sense of what's the sequence of things that happens um, before we dive into the code. And once you put your domain service in and you write the code for exposing a set of data, a set of methods on the data, then this, the VIA services tooling actually builds that project, reflects on the DLLs, and based on, those, based on reflection, generates the client-side portion of the app. And the portion that's particularly relevant is what we call domain context and a set of entities to match what you have on the other tier. So let's go ahead and look at the code that matches this. So here in the Solution Explorer, I've got two projects. I've got a solution, as I mentioned before. And I've got myapp.web, which is the server project, and myapp, which is the Silverlight project. Let's go ahead and take a look at myapp.web. I've got a data access layer here. I won't go into too many details at the moment. And then I've got this class, dish view domain service. And this dish view domain service derives from a framework class called domain service. And within it, I've got a set of methods. And this is, this is the kind of pattern that we have. Uh, you've got a set of query methods, and then a set of methods to do create, update, and delete. That's what that cut short form stands for. Essentially, insert, update, delete, and a little more of that kind of logic. You can write service operations if you want in addition. And then I've got some basic infrastructure stuff uh, for this class. So let's first look at the query methods. I've got a set of those here. Let's look at the signature briefly. So I've got this method get restaurants that returns an iQueryable of restaurant. We really use the power of link fully. And this is one illustration of how, where we use it. You, you're able to write your method as an iQueryable returning method. And that allows your UI tier, the presentation tier, to actually expose a set of capabilities like filtering and sorting. And uh, additional things like uh, paging, which can be then implemented using this uh, link infrastructure. And what it gives you is it gives you the most efficient way of implementing queries and yet the maximum flexibility. So you can 
bring the query capability as close to your user as possible and bring the execution as close to your data as possible. And later on, we'll see actually how it works at runtime. But uh, roughly speaking, that's how you should think about the query methods. They are enumerable or I queryable returning methods, on top of which the framework helps you compose queries. Another thing that this does is it says that I'm dealing with this class called restaurant. And in fact, let me show you what this is. It's a class foodie.restaurant. I've created a set of classes, and this is one of them. And what it tells Rea Services Infrastructure, Tooling Infrastructure, is that I'm interested in exposing the class restaurant and later on plate these two classes because I've got query methods that return those classes. Now let's go briefly into the DAL layer and look at it. The class plate is just a plain old CLR class by, and for, uh, by far. What I've used here is a repository that actually uses nHibernate underneath, and more about that a little later. But that's, it's just my, my simple class. There isn't any uh, framework generation here. I just hand wrote it. It's a fairly simple class, a bunch of properties, not a whole lot of additional stuff here. But it could be as complex as you want. So let's go to the domain service. So here, based on this domain service, when I do a build step, as I'd, shown, as I'd mentioned before, now, press the wrong key there. So when I do the build step, in the client project, it'll generate the corresponding entities, which is restaurant and plate. Those are the entities. And it'll also generate a domain context corresponding to this domain service. So let's go to the client project. And what I've done here is, let me show you briefly here. If I don't show all the files, you won't see any generated code. But if I click on this, I'll see the generated code. So within the generated code, and this is, after all, under the hood look. So we're going to look at all these things which you know, are not visible directly to you in the normal course of things. We've got this file, myapp.web.g.cs generated. Let me minimize this. So within this, the most interesting class that I'm going to show you is the dish view domain context. And within this class, let's look at the uh, methods and the members that are available. So this dish view domain context directly corresponds to this dish view domain service. So what we did here was we followed the pattern, and this is the naming pattern. Um, you can use attributes to describe what is a query method, what's an update method, and so on. But in this example, I've done what is sort of the norm, which is following the convention. Uh, there's sort of this split between convention and configuration. And uh, both the sides have a point. And we've chosen to be fairly agnostic, but at the same time, more in favor of convention in the sense that that's what we show typically in our examples. The convention is if you have an iQueryable returning method, and it's public, then we're going to generate a corresponding <coughs> query for that. So let's look at this method get restaurants. So I've got this method get restaurants. It's public, and it re returns an iQueryable of entity. And based on this, in this generated class, what I have is the get restaurants query. So here is the query that I have that was generated based on the method that I wrote. And basically, the framework looked at the methods and followed a convention and said, oh, this matches the convention. I don't see an attribute. I'll just use that. Likewise, there are other uh, queries as well, get plates query, search restaurants query, and so on. Now, you might be wondering why these query methods are turning into queries as opposed to methods that I can call. Uh, there are several reasons for it. One of the foremost reasons is that this is really all based on async pattern. And because of the async pattern, you really cannot just treat it like your RPC style operation call. You cannot just say, hey, I want to call that method. Because you're not going to get a blocking call in Silverlight at all. And that's a good thing. Because now your UI is not going to be freezing on the user. But because of that, what you have to do, or what rather we have to do as the framework builders, and you, you can take advantage of that, is provide a pattern that's easy to use, but that's, that actually exploits the asynchronicity of the underlying uh, Silverlight framework. And that's exactly what we've done. We've taken this method that you can execute, turned it into a query, 
And then you can load the data by saying, here is my query. Go use this query and load the data. And we'll see in, uh, during the runtime deep dive how that actually works. But that's kind of a quick point behind transforming from a query method to a query. Another interesting thing is, since I have these, this restaurant class and plate class, both of them have been exposed through public methods, they also show up in the generated code. So let's pull down, go to this pull down menu and look at what the classes look like. So here, I've got a class that derives from entity, and this is the plate class that again has the fields and the properties corresponding to what I had before. We won't look at the rest of the mechanisms right now. But here's the kind of stuff that I have. I have the standard um, plate information here, ID, name, description, etc. And I have the same sorts of stuff here. Image path, is it low calories, and so on. Uh, and likewise, restaurant entities generated as well. So this is what the view overall looks like. Now, another interesting thing here is, right now, in this domain service, I've really not expose the um, insert update delete method. So what I'm going to do is instead enable them here. And now, all of a sudden, I've got a set of methods that do the updates and do a few other things as well. So let's look at the update plate. This update plate and update restaurant methods are typical update methods. They take an entity and they do whatever is necessary to persist the changes back into whatever store that the entities came from. These get ref reflected in a very interesting fashion. So if I go here into the generated code, and I made a change, so it's going to actually uh, need to rebuild here. And based on that rebuild, we'll see the newly generated uh, code that actually incorporates the fact that I've got update methods exposed now. I'll explain what the entity container is, but right now the interesting thing is this particular one right now says enable entity operations on this one. So the framework knows that there is or there are exposed update methods. And because those methods are exposed, now those operations are enabled on the client. If I didn't expose them, this would go away. And let's, let's go ahead and do that again here. So turn this back to false. Build it. and then go back to my generated code. And then look at the container again. And it says entity side operations dot none. Nothing was enabled originally, as in no inserts, no updates, no deletes. You can't touch the data. It's read only. And now, because of the fact that you wrote a method that exposed update capability, we've enabled that on the client. And that shows up. So when, when the user actually tries to make a change, this capability is utilized to give an error immediately. If there is no uh, capability available and user tries to edit, it's going to fail. So that, in a nutshell, is sort of the basic uh, set of things that you can get from generated code. Uh, we'll look at that a little more in the next part uh, during runtime, the runtime view of it. But let's first go back to the slides and recap what we saw. So the first thing that, that was there was the class, the domain service class. And based on the attribute, enable client access, that attribute tells us that you want client to be able to access it. Think of it as a shortcut way of exposing that operation. You can obviously write a domain service in your app and use it in proc within your tier and not expose it to the uh, client at all. But this says that I want to expose it to the client. Based on that, in the client project, you see a corresponding domain context. Now, right now, it could be just, just as well empty. But as soon as I add a query method to it, I get two things. Because the query method exposes a particular entity type, and in this particular case, that entity type is a plate. Because it exposes a plate, I get the entity plate, and I get the corresponding entity query that helps me do the asynchronous call. When I add the update plate, as we saw, you get the 
extra information that uh, edit operations are enabled, and so on and so forth. I, I'll skip through this. Uh, next one is a special kind of method. I'll come back to it a little later. The next part is the runtime view. What does it look like at runtime? This is all great that it's the design time view, but how does it really work at runtime? The way to think about it is we are adding CRUD operations on top of WCF. And I'll sort of illustrate this uh, in a sequence of operations. So what happens is the user clicks some button, um, like you know, I might actually just navigate to a URI that corresponds to my app, the list of restaurants that you saw. That causes a load call. It says, hey, domain context, go load those restaurants. Domain context says, OK, all right. I'm going to check if I've got a query corresponding to that. Can I, do I have anything that exposes restaurants? OK, you want me to call get restaurants query? Fine, I'll call that. Calls that. The server side then figures out from the data access layer wherever the restaurants are, sends them back, and the asynchronous operation completes. Meanwhile, the UI is there. and uh, it, it's still interactive and it's still responsive. But now, the collections that are data bound are all filled and the data is visible to the user. In the second part, the, the view bef before this actually, the view can actually manipulate it now any which way it wants. So the user can edit data, user can add new things, do whatever is needed. All that interaction is happening on the client. Any interaction that you're doing across tiers is very deliberate and completely explicit. There is no implicit uh, chatty disc, um, kind of interaction going on between the client and the server. Only when the view says, I'm all done now. I had a set of changes I wanted to make. They're all done now. It calls submit. It says, hey, domain context, go ahead and submit all the changes. Domain context goes and figures out what the changes are, computes the set of changes, sends the change set to the server, the server then takes the right actions, it does a bunch of stuff with it, it authorizes, authenticates, does all good stuff. Works with the DAL to actually persist the changes, and then comes back with the results. And the results might be a bunch of different things. It might be failure, hey, there's no such operation, or you're not authorized to call, or uh, the database's connection is not available. Whatever the result might be, or the result might be your update went through, and here is what this, uh, this data store thinks is the latest view of your entity. So your business logic has run, and it's doing more stuff, and that's what it's going to do. And then domain context comes back and says, here are the results. And at that point, the whole operation completes. The way it manifests at runtime is there is actually a call for uh, calling a query method. And in this particular case, that, uh, that method is get restaurants query. And I've taken a very specific example here of taking two link operators for paging. This is going to the second page to load 10 restaurants. This in turn results in the get restaurants method being called. And then RIA services framework composes the skip and take on top of that. This is in addition to any link query you might have inside of the get restaurants method. This is composed on top. It's, it, all that good stuff happens. The results are brought back. And then finally, when all the changes are done and user says, I want to submit it, at that point, submit changes is called on the domain context. That results in submit on the domain service. Sorry. Submit on the domain service, and uh, that completes the overall operation. So let's look at the code. What I'm going to show you in code here is two things. First, we'll go through the whole query cycle and what it looks like. So for that, I've in fact created a hook point just to show you how this works. So here I've created a partial class just to kind of show you what happens under, under the covers. Normally you'd be calling, the actual load call would be in your view model or it would be in your code behind. In this particular case, this application uses domain data source, so it's all in XAML, and it's all sort of taken care of by the framework. But this little thing helps us observe what really happens. So let's set a breakpoint on this one. Let's get rid of that, and let's rerun this in debug mode. Now what's going to happen is every time 
the UI needs to load some data. It's going to hit this breakpoint. I didn't do the build. OK. Now let's run it in debug mode and see what happens. First thing you'll notice is that uh, you'll get the UI, and you'll, you'll actually have the grid. And then let's briefly look at the UI first here quickly. It's still waiting. This is the asynchronous operation. So let's go back to our thing here. In the query part, what I'm going to show you here is what actually happens under the hood here. Here, in, in this query, and let's drill down a little bit further here, the query name is get restaurants. This is exactly the code that you wrote. Let me enlarge that a little bit. So this get restaurants is exactly the method that you wrote, and that's what is being called underneath. So that's the information that's available when this load call is made to the framework. Now when I hit F5 again, it's actually going to go ahead and complete that one. And now one of the things I so I have this set of restaurants, the first however many I've got here, I guess first 10. And then I've got the UI that helps me do paging. And when I do paging, actually what is happening underneath is it's going to use the skip and take operators, the link operators. And it's going to tag those on to the method that brings restaurants. The get restaurants method just says, I'll bring you restaurants. And then you tack on the get, or skip and take to that. So let's go to the second page and see what happens here. Now, when I hit the second, go to the second page, I've got, again, the same kind of thing, get restaurants here. So the query name is the same. But I've got some interesting query to show you here now. It's, it also has the skip and take, the skip 10, take 10, tacked onto it. So that is what is happening. The pager says it's going to be skip 10, take 10. That thing gets serialized, gets sent over the wire. Now let's go ahead and run it further. And now I'll get the second page. And likewise, if I did any server-side uh, filtering or sorting or anything of that sort, similar link operators would get sent first from the client to the mid-tier. And then mid-tier, since it has iQueryable, will actually take it to the database where it will execute the most, in the most efficient manner possible. So you're sort of getting the best of both the worlds. Uh, the paging here is done driven by the user. That's where you want the query capability to be available. But you don't want execution there. You don't want to load a bunch of data and page over it necessarily. Of course, if you want, that's fine. And in fact, that's what happens. If I go back here, there is no, my breakpoint is not hit again. And the reason is that data already exists in the memory. But when it doesn't, so when I need to go to a different page, then it hits that breakpoint. And that's how it works. Let's go back to the code and stop this debugging session. Get rid of this app. And now, instead of the query part, I'm going to show you the, uh, how the updates work. So let's go ahead and toggle this back on. And by the way, before I get into update, there's probably one, part, one more thing that I'd like to show you in the query. So here in the get restaurants query, I already have a link query, as I'd mentioned. And this is the kind of business logic that I have here. I don't even show the restaurants that have less than a certain amount of rating. So if the average rating is not more than one, at least two is not the average rating for the restaurant. Uh, and that average is computed across all the different plates. So what I do in this query is I go into restaurants, I look at the plates, and I say, is the average rating more than one? If so, send it back. If not, don't even bother showing that. The most important point here is that I'm not directly exposing the set of restaurants from the database. This is exactly the place where I would go and write my business logic. If I want to restrict data, if I want to show only certain amount of data, if I want to somehow control how things work, this is exactly the place where I go and do that. Likewise, with this get plates, the only method that, or the only way to get plates is to give a restaurant ID. 
I have 10,000 plates in, in this database, and I don't want to show them all necessarily. I don't even accidentally want someone to call, get plates, and just get 10,000 plates. That's not something I, my server wants to do at all. And so the only way you get plates is by giving a restaurant ID. And that's a choice that you as developers of the application get to make. You decide exactly what to expose, exactly what operations to expose, and what parameters to require. So the only way to get plates in this app is by providing a restaurant ID. So that in a nutshell is how this uh, basic business logic works. But uh, let's go back to the uh, update part. So here I've enabled these methods. Let me go ahead and put a breakpoint on one of these. And in fact, instead of putting it here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, the, I'm going to go into the infrastructure part here briefly. And here I've got a submit method that I've implemented. All it does is it goes to the underlying repository and says, hey, the repository, go and flush whatever data you've got. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to set a uh, breakpoint on this one. And then I'll get to see what the change set looks like. Let's go ahead and build. For some reason, it's taking longer now. Okay, so that build is done, and uh, let's run this in debug mode. And now I'm going to go through the query thing pretty quickly. I don't have any breakpoints set on that one, and then get to a point where I'll actually make a couple of changes, and then you'll get to see how the changes get ferried from the client to the server. Looks like my network suddenly went really slow. So the, mess, oh, the images are actually coming from a remote location. They're not coming from a, the local location. And it's probably the reason why it's variable. OK. So this is my usual home page. And it's, again, downloading some of the images remotely. As soon as it's done, uh, this. Uh, progress bar goes away. So let's go ahead and look at the plates. I've got a set of interesting images and plates. And what I'm going to do is make some fairly small changes here. So let's say this calorie count 2455, that sounds kind of suspicious. I don't know if they have exactly 2455. Let's change it to 2500. Um, and just for good measure, let's change this to 5400 as well. Nice round numbers. Remember, they weren't round numbers, so when you see them again, and it in fact has the update counter as well. OK, so what I've done here is I've made two changes here, fairly targeted. And then I'm going to submit this. OK, so what happened was actually the changes were computed. I didn't tell the framework anywhere that I've made those changes. It's just that the changes were tracked by the framework, and it figured out that two Plates have changed, and now it's sent this request to the server. So let's look at the change set here. I have this count equal to two. Two change set entries, that's what I have. I made two updates. Remember, plate one and plate two, or whatever the IDs were. So let's look at those. The first one says it's an update operation. Type plate. I can go further and drill down into what the values are. And here it shows the 2,500 as the changed value. So this is the kind of thing I can do, and then let's just complete the operation. OK. And now if I look at this, these are all change values. Another thing is, instead of number of updates being two, it's three. And I'll show you in code what it actually did. So if I go here and look at the code for update method, it'll actually show you that the update code makes a change to the, let's, Okay. 
So here in my code, I decided that I wanted to change the number of updates incremented by one. And that information was propagated back to the client. So the submit operation works in a fairly interesting fashion. Uh, the user makes a bunch of changes, you know, adds to a collection, removes from a collection, makes pro sets properties, does whatever, and says, I'm done. Here, go send all the uh, changes. The server goes and processes those. And in the course of processing those, it, it might actually have new IDs, like database generated IDs. It might have um, update timestamps. It might have trigger computed values. It might have business logic computed values like this one, where instead of doing it in a trigger, which would be more typical, just to illustrate the point, I've done it here in code. And all that information is then ferried back to the client, assuming that the operation was successful, or otherwise the exception is um, ferried back. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and stop this app. So that, in a nutshell, was what we saw with respect to the overall entity lifecycle. We saw how the query works. We saw what a unit of work was. And the unit of work in this case was just two updates. But it could be a set of inserts, updates, deletes on a whole graph of objects. And it works exactly the same way. The set of changes is ferried back. And it's all done by default as a single transaction with your DAO. So if you're using Entity Framework, Link to SQL, nHibernate, any of those standard data access layers, you're basically getting transaction by default for your unit of work. If you're using some web service or something, you can use uh, system transaction, and it works exactly the same way. You just have to write, uh, you just have to enclose it in an um, appropriate system transaction. Um, we briefly saw what the domain context was. We didn't really have uh, uh, a lot of details on that one, but we'll move on to the next one. So in addition to these kind of basic capabilities at design and runtime, the other interesting part is what you can do with uh, services and what are the kinds of basic services we already have in the framework to help you uh, do your work more efficiently. Right now, I've built it without any sense of authentication, authorization, or what have you. This is just an anonymous one. Anybody can come and edit the plate, and that's obviously not a good thing. I, I don't quite want to leave my service or my application in that form. Now, even though it's really my client that's designed for working with my server part, uh, unfortunately, people on the network are not going to be as nice to me as I'd like them to. And Essentially, the server is always prepared to accept requests from wherever, and it's not going to trust. It's not going to assume that they've come from the client. It's going to treat every request that comes in. It's a WCF service. It's going to say, hey, I don't know who you are. I'm going to do all my validation, all my checks, without trusting you. And in order to help the network do that, what, I, what one should typically do, and so I'll do that, is requires authentication. OK, so once I do that, sorry. Sorry. So in here, I'm going, I've added this extra attribute, requires authentication. And that attribute basically says the entire domain service now is going to work only with authentication. And that's one way to lock down. You can say, hey, only authenticated users are allowed. But if you look at the app, it's a foodie app. I sort of want people to come and look at it. I don't want um, everybody to have to go and get registration. Maybe not yet. So instead, what I'll do is, instead of putting it on this one, I'll take it off, and I'll put it on my update plate. So this same attribute, which says, hey, the user must be authenticated, works both at class and method level. So now let me go ahead and run this one. So here what's going to happen is I'm going to start unauthenticated. I'm going to see my data because queries don't require authentication right now. I'll get my thing just fine. So I got my data. I'm happily coming here, changing this to some other number. 
So far so good, because my client is unaware. This is a rogue client, let's assume. And then I do a submit. Of course, the server didn't like that one. It said, hey, this requires authentication. And right now, I haven't really ha written any code to handle this exception. But typically, you would put the right dialogue and say, hey, I want, um, you know, you're not authorized to do this or so. And the rogue guy will obviously just get this one, or actually less than that, um, when you have the custom errors turned on. So anyway, that's kind of the basics of what happens with authentication. But more than, more than that, I might want to restrict it a bit selectively. So instead of requires authentication, I'm going to put requires role. And I've already gone ahead and used the ASP.NET uh, uh, forms authentication and set up my little ASP.NET uh, database for authentication and roles. And here I'm going to say I require admin. Now, just to kind of make it more interesting, on the get plates, I'll let any, anybody see the restaurants, but you have to be registered. So this one is going to be requires authentication. And then this one requires role, admin role. Let's build that and run it. So now I'm not logged in. I can see this one. But I required login for the plates part, so I get an error message here. Of course, I don't like to see those error messages, so I'm going to go back and log in just to get rid of the error message. And then we've got this guy, Matthew, who's written a bunch of the interesting stuff in the real services, so I'm going to use his account here. And just to kind of make my point, his background is uh, different. So you'll notice that it's, OK, he's, he gets the ugly yellow color. Uh, it, he's got his, you know, I've, I've set up a friendly name for him, the real services tech lead here. And uh, it greets him by his name. And now, since he's logged in, he gets to see the data. But he wants to do all the changes as well, so he goes and tries that, does a submit, and again fails. He's not an admin. So the main point here is that you can restrict it exactly at the level that you want. You can selectively turn off access to the entire thing. You can do it on a method level, and so on. And in fact, the, the role and user information is available on the client. So if you so wish, you can actually use the right converters and bind elements of your UI like buttons to have very role-specific um, and user-specific information in the UI itself. I, I won't go into details of that right now. OK, so the main, the main services that we covered were basically the authentication and roles ones. There's a similar um, one for profile as well. The background color was one example of that. The way it works is it's, it's declarative. It can be done at class or method level. And it integrates into the query and submit processing. And you saw the example of how it does. But this is an interesting point to mention how actually the submit or query processing works. And this is where we can add value and take care of the chores that you would otherwise do in your own service method. So what happens with domain service is when it gets a request, it first checks if the corresponding method is available or not. So for example, if it says, update this plate, it says, do I have a method to update plates? If not, send an error. Next step, it checks if it requires authentication. If it requires authentication, is this user authenticated or not? Whether it's forms authentication through cookie or uh, Windows authentication. After that, it checks whether the user is authorized or not. Is, is there a roles restriction on it? It checks that. After that, it will validate the parameters, validate the uh, method level and parameter level uh, validation rules. And only then will it actually invoke the method. So sort of through the declarative mechanisms of specifying role or authentication or validation, even before your method gets called, a bunch of checks have already happened. And so there's a lot of boilerplate work that gets taken care of by the framework. And you don't have to go and worry about it every time in your app. 
So that brings me to the sort of the last part of my talk, which is how to best use real services more effectively. I've got a set of do's and don'ts, and these are sort of based on the experience that we built up, and many of our early users have built up, and uh, we've had lots of lively discussions about how to best build these apps. In fact, some of the, uh, there are already some live apps, because we had a go live license back in July on our CTP. And uh, based on that, some of these things have come up again and again. So this is sort of the gist of it. This is not a long list or comprehensive list, but the basics of it. First thing, of course, do require authentication and roles where appropriate. Even though you're building a single app, it is a service. And so when you're exposing a service, you have to think about that one. More specifically, uh, do authenticate with HTTPS. Uh, I, I was using Cassini, so I didn't have the whole HTTPS set up here. But when you're using IIS, it's really easy to get that set up. And once it's set up, uh, all your authentication transaction actually happens over HTTPS. And that you can, in fact, mix and match HTTPS for authentication and HTTP for rest of the queries and submit. And that's certainly a thing that uh, anybody building a real app should look into. So the corresponding don't is don't deploy with anonymous access. It's interesting as a developer to build it that way initially, but always keep that in mind. The second important thing is do utilize the query composition. It's a powerful capability. You saw how the paging worked with skip and take operators and how it was executed efficiently because it was sent to the server and then to the database. You can do filtering, sorting, and paging. Those are the operators that are supported on the client. Um, I didn't really cover custom update, so I'll, I'll leave that for now. This, by the same token, the corresponding don't is that don't just expose entities because they're available. It's kind of tempting to say my data access layer makes it really convenient. For example, if I use link to SQL or entity framework, I can drag, drop, create this thing with a set of collections, entity sets, or what have you, of all the different objects that I have in the database. And it's tempting to say, hey, why don't I expose them to the client as they are? And then somebody can build some interesting applications with it. But unfortunately, that is exposed to anybody who has access on your network. So that's one part, the malicious user problem. The second problem is even the non-malicious user who is accidentally invoking some method that brings you know, 100,000 or a million objects, that's exactly the wrong thing. You don't want the service layer to catch and say, hey, the maximum packet size or maximum response size is only this much. That's not how you want your system to fail. You want to say, hey, when you get the plates, those plates are available only for a given restaurant. So you don't get 10,000 plates. You get 10, 20, 50 plates that a given restaurant sells. By the same token, you want to make sure that all the operations are also not exposed. So if all you need to do is expose or show what the plates are, there's no reason to expose update operation. If you don't need deletes, don't, don't write methods. And by default, we expose nothing. If you haven't exposed an entity, it's not going to show up. If you haven't written a query method, it's not going to show up. If you don't write a delete method, the client is just plain not going to be able to delete it. And the server, when it receives a delete request, is just going to fail even before your code gets called. So we've sort of done the basic lockdown, but if you follow that through with your practices, that's even better. Another thing, and I got a lot of questions yesterday about you know, a gentleman who was building a very large application with uh, many hundreds of entities. Many of the real applications are of that sort. You want to kind of factor it into different domain services and use them in a well-factored form. For example, this domain service I showed you only dealt with restaurants and plates. If I had a whole set of different things about negotiating with the food vendors, I'd probably put it in a different domain service. Sorry. Uh, the same do in, by the same token, the don't is don't use a single large uh, domain service class. Another one is do handle errors on the server, and I'll maybe quickly show you how to do that. And then finally, do use uh, declarative validation. We've got some attributes like range and so on that make it really simple uh, to, uh, to validate how, you know, what the range is and uh, what update should be allowed and so on. So let me at this point just go back and quickly show you a couple of things. The first thing I'm going to show you here is actually the WCF part of it. So here let me log out and get rid of the yellow background. 
and the front of the One of the things that you can do is you can see that it's really an honest to goodness service. Let me... So just to show you that, here in the plates page and even before that in the, if I go to the home page, I'll take that URL. And what I'm going to show you is what does the service, actual WCF service look like. Okay, so what I've done here is showing you what kind of happens under the covers. Here in real services, you don't have to do add service reference and configuration and all the other things. But there is enormous power in WCF that's underneath real services. And you can still tap that if you want. And in fact, here's the way to get to the .svc. And from here, I can even get to the WSDL. And so for those of you who really want the services part of it, they can actually look at this one and see what it contains. And it, it has a set of uh, methods like get restaurants and all those things are available through the, the, the output messages for those are available. There is the submit changes method that submits all the changes. So all this information is available if you so desire. But otherwise you can just use it without having to worry about all the plumbing underneath. It's still sort of helpful sometimes to know that you have the option of dropping down one more layer. All right, so with that, we're almost towards the end now. So the main thing is we've got the beta available. The beta runs on VS2008, Visual Studio 2008, SP1, and 3.5 SP1, and Silverlight 3. Um, it also, I mean, if you want to go live, we won't stop you from doing that on that one. We also have a preview that runs on Dev10, or Visual Studio 2010, and uh, .NET Framework 4, and Silverlight 4. This is what I showed today. So all my demos were based on that. However, everything I showed you today, everything, also works just as well on VS2008 and 3.5 SP1. We have a very active forum. Please join us there. Give us feedback. And all the blogs and all the documents, downloads, everything is off of this main kind of page that we have. If you go to silverlight.net and RIA services, you'll find all the information off of that. There are a few related sessions. Uh, those of you who missed Brad Abrams' session about the overview of real services, I highly encourage you to see that. It shows the nice tooling. It doesn't show the uh, under the covers part. It's all about the basic experience you have. And it's, it's pretty nice in uh, Visual Studio 2010. Uh, there is also the talk just before this one that covered how to build testable applications, uh, view models, and so on. Uh, Similar one, CL22, the other one is also about view models and covers that really well. Um, there's a Silverlight 4 feature stock that's also interesting that my colleague David Pohl did yesterday. Finally, the FT55, the developing REST applications, that's the one that explains the overall WCF family. It shows you how uh, data services, uh, RIA services, and uh, HTTP REST services can be used most effectively. There's a whole set of other talks. Right after this one, there's a sync framework talk. And we're also working with them for uh, enabling offline in a future release, not, not in V1, but in a future release. And finally, please, please, please do fill out the eval form. I know it takes a few minutes, but there's a charity that's going to benefit from this. The local Boys and Girls Club is going to benefit from this. So please do fill out the eval forms. Uh, we do, do actually read that. and. Based on the feedback, we do actually make changes from one PDC to the next. And then finally, there's more information that I'll leave out there. <laughs> if you have questions, there are some mics here. I'll be here for, I'll be here for a couple of minutes, and then I'll 
probably have to vacate for the next speaker. Hi, uh, thanks for the, for the talk. Uh, one question on the, the roles. Uh, a common scenario that we often see is where, for example, in your restaurants example, you have restaurants ordered in a hierarchy like cities and countries, and you only have a role in a particular subset of that hierarchy. So like, you have the admin role for Seattle. Uh, how can you enable that using your framework, or is that something you have to really go out and build yourself? Okay, so the question is really about how roles can be data specific, data driven role implementation. Uh, the basic implementation of the attribute itself is not role, is not data specific, but so there, there are two ways. One is to think about handling that in code itself, and we've got the extensibility points for doing that. That's one way. And the second one is if factoring of the domain service is appropriate based on data, and you really have different sets of rules, then that's another uh, potential uh, option. I don't know which one works best for you. Okay, Those thank you. Okay. Can you just go to the mic so everyone can hear it? So, um, did you guys remove the, I mean, in Visual Studio you have domain service where you can actually click and get your NGT and create all the queries, the CRUD. Did you guys remove that? Uh, did we remove the, well, the wizard that gives you the queries and CRUD? We did not remove that at all. It's still there. It was, in fact, used in Brad's application, I think. Uh, but I just didn't cover it because it's sort of the introductory part. Okay. There wasn't much under the covers there, so I okay, didn't cover it. It's there. Okay, thanks. The, uh, <coughs> the query feature where you can retrieve entities and submit uh, changes back to the server, does that just work for single entities or does that work with object graphs as well? Okay, the question is uh, query and submit, do they work with single entities or object graphs? Both query and submit work just as well with a hierarchy of objects. Uh, I didn't really get a chance to go into all the details of that, but you can send plates with the restaurant if you want, just to take that example. Make changes to a restaurant, add new plates, delete some plates, create a new restaurant, send all of that in a single batch. All of that is works on graphs, or to be more precise, forests of graphs, or forests of trees. All right. Thanks. Are, are Do you have a time frame? Sorry. I, I, oh, sorry. Sorry. Um, I'm trying to figure out who exactly is handling the async part of this for me. Um, so for example, if I wanted to call the domain service from a view model, is it really the, the load that's resynchronizing for me, or is it the data bound controls and the way you're doing it that's ending up handling the async nature of this? Okay, so what handles async? The async pattern is handled by the fact that the load call actually results in a set of uh, entities being brought, they're actually added to the entity list. And you've already data bound that entity list. And so we've created the entity list with all the right uh, collection change notification and other notifications. And so because of that, you have a change notification aware collection that handles it in a nutshell. I'm going to take one more here, and then I'll be on the side so that the next speaker can get started here with setup. Do you have a timeline to make it available for WPF? The question is, do we have a timeline for making it available for WPF? No, we do not have a timeline. Uh, there are no announced dates for, uh, and it's not in our scope of V1. And I want to add one more thing. Our V1 is, uh, the beta that you see is practically feature complete, or rather the preview for, dev, for Visual Studio 2010 that you see is practically feature complete. And from now onwards, we'll be concentrating on perf and stress for V1. And post V1, we'll look at all these things for sure. But V1 is really focused on Silverlight. I'll be available here, but I'm going to get off the podium so my friend Mark can get set up with his sync talk.